Uh, well, good morning, and uh, good to see everybody again. This is my fourth time at Super Week, and it's super fun to be back here in Hungary. Um, thank you to Zoli for, for being always the great host and for putting the conference on. It's really become uh, kind of a, a privilege that I look forward to every year to come here because I feel like this conference has become uh, really a great collection of the industry. We love what we do. We're here for analytics and the passion of, of data and, and what we do in that field. So what I want to talk about is this idea that kind of started really percolating at the beginning of this year. There's always this drive to have more data, more measurements. Um, but what does that really mean? So I'm going to uh, talk about a series of um, uh, sessions I went to at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, and some insights from that that I'll share with you. At Analytics Pros, what we seek to do is this idea of blending uh, the art and science of digital analytics. So uh, it's not just about data science, it's not just about the numbers, there's a lot of art that goes into it, which is creativity and problem solving. Um, but there's also science to it, so we have to blend the two, ultimately for the goal of helping our clients and customers to come closer together through data and analytics. Uh, we work with companies all over the world, and so a lot of the perspective that I bring to presentations like this is from experiences working with these. I don't generally get to do specific company case studies because of restrictions on what data we can share for clients, but a broad array of different industries and different types of organizations that we get to work with. So at CES, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, has anybody ever been there? No? Okay. So at CES, this is crazy annual show. It is held in Las Vegas and it brings about uh, 300,000 people to Las Vegas in one week, which is a lot of people to put into a city. Even though Las Vegas can handle a lot of additional people, it's still a lot of people. This year, it was really exciting. They actually had Uber and Lyft uh, in the city, but it was still impossible to get a vehicle to go between places. To give you a sense of what CES is like, this is Panasonic Stadium. So they have these show halls that are like a mile long, it's a couple kilometers probably long. Uh, huge, huge. And they build these massive things. This is a multi-story fake stadium that Panasonic builds for their booth to show their latest electronics. Um, I like this, I snapped this, because I think this pretty much sums up CES in one photo. We have um, the future is here, uh, view the future, headphones with virtual reality, that was the big, one of the big things this year. We even have a drone hovering here, just because why not? Let's have a drone, throw it in. Um, so CES is just kind of this crazy time to show all the new ideas and the new technology that's out there. Here's another example of multiple stories tall of giant flat screens they just arranged just Again, because, look, these are new cool TVs, you should buy one. Uh, this was an interesting thing this year. A Laundroid. It's a laundry folding robot. It's actually more a closet. You get this thing, it's like the size of half your room probably, and you put your clothes into it and it washes, dries, and folds them and puts them on a shelf for you. Which is kind of interesting. Uh, it reminded me maybe of early computers. Probably someday we'll have something much smaller that will do this. But Thinking ahead to the future, this is a really interesting example of that. Um, here are uh, Roombas, essentially. You know what a Roomba is? A, a vacuum, robotic vacuum that goes around your house. Anybody have one? Yes. Do you love it? Yeah. Yes. It's like the best thing. So the rest of you, go buy a Roomba and, or, or something like it. It is the best appliance ever. You just push a button and it vacuums the floors for you. Well, they have them for your windows now if you want to wash your windows. I don't know that I'd really want to put one on because I, I just think, what if it falls off? Somebody's walking down the street and a robotic window cleaning vacuum falls to the ground. Um, here's a, some robots. This is a group in San Diego that is using technology to help teach kids programming. And so they can kind of plug these things together and program them. Um, and these were dancing to some music. I thought, that's pretty cool. That's interesting. Uh, this is a, um, a robot that actually was fairly, I wouldn't say scary, but very interesting. And, and the closest thing to kind of a future reality of, of robots 
uh, in, in our world. This was debuted by SoftBank out of Japan during a presentation by IBM. And this thing is hooked up to IBM's Watson API, IBM's um, basically artificial intelligence platform. And it can take in natural language and then respond in multiple languages. Uh, it can sense tone and uh, respond with different parameters based on um, the detected tone, if you're being sarcastic uh, or, or serious, for example. Uh, so they had a demo of it. I tried to get a video in here, but it didn't really want to play in PowerPoint. Uh, but that was pretty interesting to see a robot that, that humans interact with. And apparently they're using these in certain industries in Japan already, like hospitality. Um, you know, you walk up to it and you ask it questions and it gives you answers about the hotel or the area. Here's GoPro, uh, one, of, one of my favorite brands and, and a, a client. Uh, their booth was enormous this year and, and just kind of fun stuff. Um, like the suit from the movie The Martian. See the movie The Martian? They were GoPro cameras all throughout um, that movie. And they had the, the suit that the main character wore uh, in that movie. And I couldn't help but throw this in. So this looks an awful lot like a GoPro, yeah? It's not a GoPro. <laughs> So here's a company a few booths away from GoPro that literally has ripped off their product in basically every factor of design and is marketing it. Um, and, and that goes at CES. Uh, and here's kind of the last fun and interesting. Last year I saw a, a little um, set of robots. This one I thought was a bit more fun and interesting, uh, remote controlled and kind of creepy. So moving into the big takeaways from CES, the, one of the biggest themes this year was the Internet of Things, IoT. And I always get very skeptical of new stuff at a show like CES because they talk about the future that it really isn't here yet. Last year, uh, CES seemed like it actually had stuff that, was, that has come out in the last year that was much more real and practical. This year seemed a, lot, a bit more kind of high in the sky and not really ready for reality yet. But there was a very, very strong undercurrent of this, the Internet of Things being here, or very nearly here, meaning everything constantly connected and collecting data. Um, that resonated throughout all of the different conversations. And so this gets me thinking, what do we as a digital analytics industry need to be doing and thinking about when it comes to the Internet of Things? So uh, some, some key takeaways. If you think that the data that we get today is a lot, imagine data from everything being totally connected. So not just a website and a phone application, but physical environments, machines, products that we use, the rooms that we're in, the vehicles we occupy, uh, the clothes that we wear, all connected and collecting data. Um, there's going to be so much more data to deal with. And this is a challenge, an opportunity as well. The big question is this data going to be actionable? So, so, okay, we can collect six terabytes per second of data from all this stuff. What do we do with that? Collection is not necessarily valuable. So I think as an industry, we need to be mindful of that. Uh, I tend to fall on the side of collect more uh, because you probably will be able to learn from it later. If you don't collect it, you'll never have that opportunity. But I think there's definitely going to be an upper limit of what's realistic and what's possible. Um, the other interesting topic that came up with this is around privacy, there's the push and pull of, OK, well, we don't want people to have our data. Yet at the same time, to make much of the, uh, most of the stuff work, they have to have lots of data to draw from. So what kind of data are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the data that is inherent to how a product works? Or are we dealing with the data that is about customers using a product or responding to marketing? Um, so that's the thing that we need to be thinking about. The data that is uh, inherent to the product, if your product or the thing you make or sell is a data product, I would say that's, that's a different set of data than what we as digital analysts are going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the data that we collect about how people use the product, how people navigate through a user interface. Uh, data that could help to classify and segment users uh, and their behaviors so we can better understand them. But that's different than 
uh, a product that exists, say like a, a Fitbit or a, a health product that collects a lot of data, um, and that is the product, is making that data accessible to you. Two different kinds of data, and we shouldn't get the two confused. Um, this was kind of a very scary thought. <laughs> Imagine if we were able to collect, or someone is collecting all of this data all the time, constantly, what that could be used for, for profiling and segmentation of your users. Who's truly engaged in interacting with you? Uh, that smart laundry washing machine robot thing. How often do you use it? What do you use it for? How many pieces of laundry do you fold? How do you interact with the app that controls it? All that data could be put together for better or worse. So here's an example of this. So uh, BMW had this fabulous tent booth construction thing, and they had this big thing about their open mobility cloud and a really cool futuristic car made out of carbon fiber, and it's all internet connected. And when I asked them, okay, well, great. So I walk into my smart home from BMW with my smart mirror from BMW with my smart car from BMW, and it tells me what my day is going, what's happening in my day, and it pulls my car out of the garage and puts it in front of the house. Awesome. So I just want to connect it to my Google Calendar because that already has everything. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to, you have to put it into our system. Okay, so right there, I'm done. I'm not buying the BMW smart house, smart car, smart mirror, smart life because I'm not gonna sit on some probably fairly terrible UI and put stuff in. So is it really open? Is it really connected? Uh, this is a challenge that I think they have not figured out, um, but hopefully eventually will. Uh, the second big takeaway was privacy and security, so a big spotlight on this. Um, and and this, is, this is in America, where there's frankly not that much talk about this. Um, I got to sit into in a session that was very, very interesting with uh, the chairman of the FCC and the chairwoman of the FTC, uh, the big regulatory bodies in the United States that would be the ones that probably could set policy if they chose to. Um, they really haven't set much in terms of policy or stringent policy, there are recommendations. But what I heard was very interesting. The things that stood out to me from uh, Chairman Wheeler of the FCC was this fully connected world. They now acknowledge this. Welcome to 2016 in the governments. Um, we are fully connected, and that connectivity uh, is driven increasingly by wireless communications. This is a fairly side note and off stream to what we do, but, but the key thing here is the wireless spectrum, at least in the United States, is, is limited, but more and more is opening up. And so that means more stuff is going to be able to talk to each other with higher bandwidth and throughput. Um, that's going to be very interesting as companies move in to fill that space and leverage all of that additional bandwidth. Concerns and things to watch. So Chairman Wheeler talked about privacy, and, and what he spoke on was that re he really seems stuck on trust, and I think this is a huge, huge takeaway for us. And um, I think Europe is ahead of America on this and, and many other parts of the world, um, but it's still a challenge. And regardless of what the regulations are, how are we building trust with our customers, and, and what does that mean? So um, security around how data is collected. If you can't maintain trust that the data is going to be kept in a secure fashion, you can't have trust. So that was pillar number one from Chairman Wheeler. Transparency was seconds. What are you collecting and how are you going to use that data? Uh, and then third was uh, choice. Does the customer, the end user, have a choice in that? So these are three big things. Now when I hear this coming from an American uh, government top official, that's very interesting that they're articulating this publicly and openly and, and talking about this. And there are some committees and open dialogues that are going to be kicking up this year. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. If, if the United States, I think, moves in a much stronger direction of actually creating some real policy and, and requirements, legislation around this, I think that will be a big um, shakeup to our industry. So how do you get ahead of that? Follow these guidelines. Um, so the other thing is um, on the FTC side, what was interesting, what really stood out is one, the FTC is, is responsible for how do the consumer markets and the economy and business interact? And how do we in the American government support that? Um, 
So they see this consumers wanting data on the one hand. On the other hand, they see a huge problem of consumers not trusting what, what's being done with that data. Um, the other thing that they raised was, and they just released a report on this, with, if you just Google it or my slides will be available, you can follow the link in it. Uh, this is really interesting, this facet of not creating um, discrimination or bias based on data analysis. I thought that's really, really interesting. Um, if we go look at a set of data and we start analyzing it and we find the high value customer segments and we cater only to that customer segments, are we potentially not serving a set of customers that we really need to be serving? Maybe they just don't perform to the same set of expectations that our data says. Um, and this is a very interesting thought and very challenging to me on what do we need to be doing as an industry to be mindful of this. Um, so don't let your data and your analysis entrench existing biases um, or disparities in your customers? How do you open up ways to better serve all your customers um, using data, not just cater to a certain subset? Obviously, that does have to be balanced to you need to make money and you want to optimize your business. Concerns or points to watch that, that uh, Chairman Ramirez raised, um, IoT, privacy, and ubiquitous data collection, data everywhere, definitely on her radar as well as a challenge area. Um, Again, this notion of trust. Can consumers trust that the data is how the data is being collected, used, stored, shared, and made secure? Um, and this is a really good article that was cited. Uh, the Pew Research, which is a research body, uh, Pew Trust is a, a research body in the United States, and uh, they did a, a survey on American sen sentiment and attitudes about privacy and surveillance. What strikes me is that there is still an incredible amount of naivety or, or just misunderstanding or lack of awareness um, in what data actually is collected. And I think this goes back to the transparency. If you walk up to the average person on the street in the US, maybe in Europe, and you ask them, do you know what a cookie is? Not the kind you eat, the kind on your computer. You're going to hear a lot of very different responses. Um, most often, if I ask somebody, what is a cookie? They think it's a bad thing. It's not really a bad thing. It could be used for bad things, but it's really not to blame for the evils of privacy infringement on the internet. It's just a component of the technology that helps the internet function. So the lack of understanding and lack of transparency, I think, is a problem that we've created as an industry, and we need to work very hard and quickly to help resolve. So on these two topics, I was literally leaving this session, walking to another session, and I walked by a door with this on it. I thought this was really interesting. Here at the Las Vegas Convention Center, we track you all the time everywhere, basically is what it's saying. Um, so they're being transparent, right? They're sh telling me about what's happening. Um, and they're giving me choice. If you don't want to be tracked, go back to the Stone Ages and turn off your technology. Welcome to the Consumer Electronics Show where we tell you to turn off your technology. Like, there's an, I can't do that. I can't go dark. Um, and I maybe don't feel really great after seeing this sign. Like, I was unaware that they were tracking me, although they do have an app. And in this app, you actually can see where you on, are on the show floor in these huge buildings where GPS doesn't work. And it's because they have beacons everywhere. Um, and I didn't really think I'm uncomfortable with this. But then I saw this sign and I thought, I, I don't know, they don't see anything here about um, what they're going to do with the data or how it's going to be kept secure. And I thought this was just the perfect embodiment of how part of it can be done well, informing and giving choice, although this is really not very good choice. And uh, there's not enough additional information. There's no description of the benefit. Maybe this sign could say, we provide you a better conference experience using our apps. To do that, we have to measure your location with beacons and Wi-Fi location technology. If you don't want to have our help navigating these massive halls, you could turn off these things on your phone. Um, they'd obviously have to get that shorter on a door, but this could be explained in a much better way than how they explain it here. So, 
if you look at the privacy policy of your website or your app or your digitally smart TV or whatever it is that you're measuring, is it this kind of a sign? We're tracking you, you might want to leave or not use our website. Like, that actually is kind of what it is. I set up a uh, LG smart TV about a year ago, and there's a privacy policy, which I, of course, read, and that privacy policy <laughs> says, we're going to track you down to the zip code and basically measure everything we possibly can about you. And if you don't want to do this, say no. But if you say no, your TV is basically a brick on the wall. You can't use any of the smart connected features. The whole point of this expensive new TV is to be able to stream digital content to it, but to use those features, you have to activate this kind of all in or all out um, technology and, and measurement. So this was a big kind of resounding area that really got me a little bit, uh, or a lot bit probably more on fire about this topic than I have been in the past. Number three, I attended a really interesting session uh, done by Disney. So some pretty high level people from Disney, the uh, executive vice president for uh, enterprise and tech, um, basically their chief information officer, chief information security officer, um, executive vice president for Imagineering, which is their kind of new stuff that they come up with at Disney, and uh, effectively their CTO for consumer products um, and interactive media. The guy in charge of the 88 apps across 14 different platforms. Um, so they talked about how they reach about 100 million users monthly across all their websites and apps. They have implemented digital analytics across everything with one unified platform. They have unified uh, signed in experiences with an underlying data set that they can use to uniquely measure the user across those platforms. And the way they approach this, and I think this is really important, is they say that they leverage their data to give consumers the experience they want. Disney is a very smart business, and I don't think they're up to evil things here. They're up to making money, and they're really, really good at making money. So what do they do? They focus on measuring consumer needs and preferences down to unique, unique person level and do that across platforms and experiences. So consumer needs, preferences, unique level platforms and experiences across all of it. What do they do? Example that they gave was um, you might have your favorite teams in your ESPN app and you can go into a ESPN um, sports um, studio bar. I'm not really into sports, so I don't really know much except football and the Seahawks, which don't get me started. Um, so you go into one of these places at Disney World and apparently like, they use that data to actually customize your experience. They know you're there if you're using their app and you're signed in. And it, it can give you favorite teams and, and whatnot. That's really interesting um, that they would tie, go so far to tie it together. So the big takeaway here is, are you collecting data that's focused on understanding your customer to help ultimately serve them better, to provide them a better experience, to provide them more of what they want? If you focus on using data to understand what their needs and wants are so that you can deliver that, you're, you're going to go in a direction that's probably away from the sign at the convention center and in a direction that's a much better exchange of value, both to your customer and to you. Number four, this was, this was interesting, a, a keynote by the uh, CEO of IBM. And uh, she described the data as mankind's next most important resource. So coal is a resource, oil is a resource, they're saying data is a resource. This is very, very interesting. So she gave a great keynote that, that covered a wide array, wide array and range of topics. And one of the big questions was, when everybody becomes digital, what then? It's kind of this arms race of digital, perhaps. Um, if everybody is using digital effectively, where's the competitive advantage? So one of the key points was digital should not be this idea of a destination for your business. It should be a foundation upon which you build your business. And I think many companies have come to that, but many, many still aren't there. It's not this, oh, we're going to become a digital company. It is reality. We are digital or we're dead. And how do we build on top of that? So how are we helping the companies that we work for, the clients that we serve, realize that and act on that? That idea that 
destina- it's not a destination, it's a foundation. The other thing that, that really stood out and, and what they focused on was this idea of cognitive. Now, I put this clearly in the range of buzzword. We'll see if it lasts a year or two. But cognitive data was an interesting topic. And the idea being that cognitive data is, ju- is not just the data. It's the data plus a level of intelligence built on that data. And this is where they talked about their Watson technology, which I didn't even know there was an API. Apparently there is. And it's being used in 36 countries by about 80,000 different developers. Um, which is a fairly substantial user base. Um, one of the key things that they see in the world as a problem, and obviously IBM is working with a lot of different companies, shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, most people, most companies still can't take action based on their data. Uh, so Under Armour was an example of a company that they're working with, a, a mutual client with us at Analytics Pros, and in their record app, they're taking data from, um, from the Under Armour record app, which you can integrate and tie in collection from a lot of different smart devices and um, different apps like Map My Fitness, Map My Run, and Domoto My Fitness Pal. It goes into record, which is basically this digital record of your life. And then they ship that data up to Wat- Watson's um, API. And then it comes back. And they use that to help provide recommendations about what you should do in health and fitness. You should run 13 minutes more per day. You should eat a little bit less of this food. Uh, they're even doing social analysis and saying people who are like you, based on demographic factors, who have similar goals that, like you that you've set, are doing this, and you're not. Maybe you should try that too. Um, leveraging in kind of the social concept for improving health and wellness, which is, is really cool. Very interesting way to use data. That data that's going in here, I would say, is different than digital analytics data that we deal with. That is the data of the people that's generated by what they're doing. The product is that data. But on top of this, how are they measuring the user experience, the the platform, how people use the application to improve it? Again, kind of differentiating the data that is produced uh, about the product, about how people use the product versus the data that is the product. The last uh, takeaway that I wanted to to touch on was from a panel with several CMOs. including NBC uh, Universal. And this kind of takes it from big ideas down to really tactical and practical. They still want to measure and track TV, and they still can't do it. So big realization they talked about from the stage, 70 to 80% of people are watching TV with digital devices in hand. So TV's not dead. People still watch broadcast cable TV. And they're doing it with a device in hand. Um, But what they'd really like to be able to do is measure a perfect response. How many people saw that ad? How many people then responded? And what did they buy? And that's fairly hard to do. Although, as I started thinking about it, um, it's really, I think, not that far away. You could probably get fairly close to this today with Google Analytics. Here's an example of real-time data when a TV ad airs, large broadcast for a fairly large brand. But look at that. TV ad airs, and traffic just shoots way up. Now, if you do this, and if you, either the company you work for or a client that you're working with is running TV ads, and you can find out when one is airing in a market, you can go into GA and drill down to the hour, to the minute, to the market area, or the geo, and see what response looks like. If you segment for users coming from direct and organic, excluding things like email, maybe include paid, branded, search, um, exclude social, that's a fairly focused slice of people who heard about you and are responding. If you then break that down by geography and minute, and you know when a TV ad airs, you could actually create a segment in GA that would be able to say, the people in this market who came for the first time from direct on this minute, which is the minute we know you know, the ad aired, or the minute after the ad aired, and then see what they do. That's fairly good analysis, actually. There's a good set of data there, and you could gain some interesting insights. It's not perfect. It's not this kind of creepy, um, we're watching people's eyeballs and scanning their retinas and knowing that they saw this TV ad and then knowing what they bought, um, but probably good that we're not doing that. So where does this come to, this this idea and the promise of digital analytics? Uh, I snapped this photo, which I thought was a great one. 
translating data into action. Um, this is what we ultimately should be focused on. Out of all of the data that's available, and all of the great new technology that's coming, and all of the new forefronts of data that are going to be available, um, how do you turn it into action? But I would argue even action itself isn't the end. It's bringing value to your, to your company or to your clients. And value comes from taking action. If we look back um, at, at this hierarchy, a data hierarchy, um, data is the raw data that we collect, this base level. These are the hits, the log files, the collection hits into your analytics tool. Information would be the, the, the reports that are generated from that, what you see when you log into your analytics platform. Knowledge is where you start to do analysis. What does this data mean? I have a graph, I have a trend line, I can see what's happening, stuff is up, stuff is down. We see traffic coming in from a geo right after a TV ad aired, maybe people are responding. Wisdom is the layer in, in where we look at how do we apply that knowledge to our business context. Oh, this ad aired in this market, this ad aired in this other market, adjust for population, oh, this one didn't perform as well, what do we do about that? And then ultimately that insight produced from the wisdom should lead to an action, but you have to take action. You have to actually do something different to get value. If we look back, um, this idea that technology delivers these bottom two layers, I think is very true. And, and people deliver the rest. I think I saw this actually at an eMetrics many, many years ago, maybe Bob Page or someone, uh, no, Eric um, Demystified. Peterson, yeah, um, was big on people versus technology. This is, this is a, a theme that, that I think we all probably understand fairly well in the industry. What I think is interesting is, is we might be at a turning point, an evolutionary point, where this perhaps could be changing. What are we going to do about that? Does that put us in jeopardy? Does that put us out of a job? Threaten our job. Um, I've been thinking about this and kind of thinking about the progression of analytics technology as I see it. And you know, if I look back, we have early web analytics technology, kind of the 1.0 if we want to use .0 stuff in this. Um, log file analysis. Anybody remember AW stats way back? Yeah. Um, old Urchin, old Web Trends, all these classic log file processing engines, of which there are shockingly few still around. Um, then we moved into tag-based platforms. Omniture came to market. Um, there were Hitbox and, and some of the other products that got rolled up into it. Now Adobe, obviously Google Analytics coming from Urchin on demand. Um, these 2.0 platforms, this is what I'd say is the predominant market of, of analytics. This is what almost everybody is using, is in this category. Um, and these platforms are good because they have a broad capability. They can measure across lots of different types of technologies. And they can collect a vast amount of data uh, and process it and report it for us quite well. The third is, I call the 3.0. I call these point solutions. Products that popped up really out of the space created by these bigger players. You know, Mixpanel for years marketed themselves as people analytics. Um, people buy things, not sessions, because GA was session focused. Um, so they, 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 they popped up in to fill specific slices of the market. But I don't think they really fill the broad range. I don't think any one of these kind of 3.0 solutions is the only solution that you need. You might need it in addition to a GA or Adobe. Um, there are certainly great things that you can do with it, but they're not broad enough. They're not integrated. They're not the platform that we need. Um, but it's been very interesting to see this come into market. The 4.0 is what, what I'm thinking about here. This is what's the future. And I think we're entering a space where we're going to have, or we need to have, a much more open set of platforms. And we see that with things like Google Analytics, its APIs make it a fairly open platform. Certainly, these 3.0 solutions are built inherently open with great APIs for data in and data out. Um, fully integrated across platforms. So, um, you know, things take, taking not just web and uh, app measurement, but tying in with advertising measurement uh, across the entire consumer digital experience, across other points of collection. Uh, and then last is intelligent. Technology that actually becomes intelligent about data. And that's where I think we start to get this middle layer. I don't think we're near a place where people are irrelevant and the machines are going to tell us what to do. 
But I think we're entering, or maybe have already started into, uh, a range where the knowledge, what does this data mean, can start to be provided by increasingly better technology. And that has implications for us as an industry. Um, so how do we start, how do we think about this and act on this for the future? Um, how can you prepare? So a few thoughts on this. One, get to a place where you thoroughly understand your known and unknown customers. You're not going to be able to know who everyone is. Disney, I'm sure, does not know who 100% of those 100 million users are. Uh, some of the really big companies that we work with have great signed-in rates. Still, it's a fairly small percentage of traffic. So if you can define a framework, though, to identify your knowns versus your unknowns, you can at least start to separate the two. And I think this is really, really critical. Um, so known is going to be signed in users. And you have to create an exchange of value for users. We're going to track you in our space. We're going to track you on our website. We're going to measure you across all of our different products that you might use. Um, here's what it means. Here are your options and choices. Here's the value and benefits that you get. Here's how we're going to protect your data and, and provide security for you. Um, so, so work on that now if you're not already doing that. And the second is build a broad foundation of data collection. So you know, Google's Universal Analytics, uh, as they rolled this out a few years ago, building a way to actually send data in from many different uh, touch points, pieces of technology. These tools are there. You need to be thinking about, and if not, building on collecting data from across your digital landscape. Um, the third is make sure that you're measuring all marketing channels. This, this sounds probably basic, but it is still rarely done fully. And this takes a lot of organizational effort and discipline and governance and maintenance to make sure you're always identifying your marketing channels. If you don't do that, you can't begin to understand the marketing picture clearly. Um, the last is integrate your data landscape. So you're probably not in a world where you have one tool that does everything perfectly. Any, anybody feel like they have one perfect tool that does everything you need? No. So you're going to have data from a lot of different sources. Your business records, your CRM, your digital landscapes. You need to bring that data together in a place where you can actually make sense of it and use it. Because the data inputs are only going to grow massively. And you also need to be building into this practices and processes for governance of that data, for privacy, and for security. So um, with a couple minutes, I wanted to see if there were any questions, anything else I could answer, any curiosities about um, CES or any of the topics. And uh, I'll also be around uh, most of the rest of this week. Thank you. Thank you.